So, so I will start my, my, so my talk will cover more or less a brief introduction into TDP and FAS um, identification and then I will talk a lot of things about which we are currently doing, which are, most of these things are not published, and therefore there are sometimes also some open ends, which I cannot answer right now, but I thought that might be more interesting than talking about published things. So as a brief introduction, so these diseases I'm interested in is a disease which is called frontotemporal dementia. It's the second most common cause um, in the pre-senile group of um, patients, so which is defined as under 65 years of age. And it's a clinical, genetically, and neuropathological heterogeneous group when we just hear the name frontotemporal dementia. The clinical symptoms, they are characterized by the, these patients have a predominant atrophy of these frontal and temporal um, lobes in their brain, and therefore they have a predominant problems with their behavior and um, so there's a behavior burden, or they have problems with language um, dysfunctions. And there's a strong genetic contribution with about 30 to 40 percent having an autosomal dominant trait of inheritance. The second disease we are interested in is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It's the most common neuromuscular disease. These patients have predominant atrophy of the first and the second um, motor neuron resulting in muscle weakness and wasting. And here we have about 10 percent, which are familial. And it was recognized for, actually for a long time, actually for more than 10 years, that there is a striking clinical overlap between both of these um, diseases with about 50 to 20 percent of patients with frontotemporal dementia having at least some signs of motor neuron disease, and vice versa, about 50 percent of ALS patients having some signs of cognitive impairment. Um, in about 15 percent, this is so severe that they got this additional diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia. So there was already this idea that there might be an overlap. When we look at the neuropathology of both of these um, diseases, the major subgroup of frontotemporal dementia was back in 2006 characterized by inclusions which were just labeled by, we could label by ubiquitin as an unspecific marker for whatever proteins which form, which accumulate. Um, therefore, they were called FTLDU. And vice versa, in, in ALS, we had inclusions for, which were just being able to recognize by ubiquitin. All of them were silver and thioflavin negative of, as for markers which are characteristic for amyloid-like inclusions, they are tau and cyanuclein negative. But there was this idea whether there might be an overlap also on the neuropathological basis. And the idea what we had is to define the ubiquitinated proteins. So this um, was something we were actually quite successful in the last um, five years, and we more or less resolved almost all of that. Um, so when we go back to the ubiquitinated inclusions in FTLDU and ALS, this was known for several years that there is a protein which is called SOD1, which plays a role in a small subset of ALS cases. In 2006, TDP was identified as the disease protein in the, really in the vast majority of these conditions in FTD patients and in ALS patients. About 10% of these diseases in 2009, the protein FAS was identified also in FTD and ALS patients, and I will talk about these two groups of um, diseases now in more detail and tell you what we are working on that. So just a brief introduction how we got to identify TDP, because I need that for some um, other stuff I have to tell you. So what we did is we did a sequential extraction protocol starting from brain material from a patient with this disease. We enriched that for highly insoluble proteins. We used that to load on a gel. The high molecular stuff was used to immunize mice. These mice were then used to generate monoclonal antibodies. The monoclonal antibodies were screened for histology to identify those which recognize the inclusions, and these were then used to to um, biochemical analysis, which allowed us to identify bands around 25, which then turned out by mass spec analysis that this is a part of TDP-43. So this was the whole story behind that. Um, TDP-43, I don't have to tell you a lot how this protein works. You know that better than I do. So it's highly conserved, ubiquitously expressed nuclear protein. It has two RNA binding protein. It has a glycine-rich C-terminal part. 
nuclear localization and nuclear export sequence, which allows them to shuttle between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Um, so it's tightly controlled, which was done, actually, you investigated that. It's essentially a normal development because the early embryonic, so it's early embryonic lethal in knockout mice. And the important thing why I show that is actually there is these mutations which have been found, most of them in familiar forms of ALS. They are clustered in the C-terminal region, but the important thing is you have, we have mutations which segregate, so in this gene we have mutations, and these mutations segregate with the disease in this family. So which is, I think, and very, was very important that we were able to find these mutations because it provides a clear evidence for a direct link between a TDP dysfunction um, and the disease, and that it's not just the bystander that we have accumulation of the protein, but that there is really a direct link of TDP dysfunction and the disease. So therefore, these mutations were extremely good that they have been uh, recognized. However, I have to say the consequences of these mutations, we still don't have a good idea what they are doing, and I will come back to that also later. So just how does the pathology of these um, diseases look like? So it is uh, said the accumulating protein in the vast majority of FDLDU cases, which is now called FDLD-TDP. We have these cytoplasmic inclusions, which are shown here in the cortex and in the motor neurons. And you can already appreciate here that once you have a cytoplasmic inclusion, you see a loss of the normal endogenous nuclear staining um, for TDP compared to a chasen cell which, where the nucleus is brown. In addition to the cytoplasmic inclusions, we sometimes see intranuclear inclusions, and what we also see is that there's a widespread glial pathology um, besides the neuronal um, pathology in these conditions. I mentioned that there are familiar forms of FTLD, and there were actually three where the pathology was ubiquitin positive, those with progranulin mutations, the new identified cases with a C9 or 72 mutations, VCP mutations, chimp 2 b And what we found out is that actually all these three forms of familial forms are all characterized by TDP um, pathology. Um, the next thing then, we identified the TDPs of the um, protein in the vast majority of ALS cases, uh, which is shown here in the motor neurons. And these data were actually the first data which really provided um, on a molecular basis the evidence that indeed frontotemporal dementia and ALS represent a clinical pathological spectrum of diseases which most likely share a common pattern mechanism. So to summarize what are the pathological hallmark features of TDP, so this is showing in, shown in this slide. So as I already mentioned, the important thing is what we see, that there is a complete redistribution from the nucleus to the cytoplasm um, in inclusion-bearing cells. So this is shown here. So this seems to be, um, so this is a very constant finding also here in the motor neurons. And it suggests that, there, that the loss of nuclear function might be involved in the pathogenesis. In addition to having now an antibody which labels the inclusions, we also found that there are some striking biochemical changes of the protein in the disease. And they consist of, if you, here's a, the urea fraction of a control brain. This is the FTLD TDP brain. So what you see, this is the normal um, TDP band. The pattern looks completely different in the patient. So we have these C-terminal um, fragments. We have a higher molecular full length um, TDP band. And then we have these high molecular um, smear. And part of that different um, pattern comes from the result that TDP is hypophosphorylated, um, which is here demonstrated by a phosphor-specific antibody recognizing 49410 phosphorylation um, of these proteins, though, which recognize that this is really hypophosphorylated um, TDP, which is accumulating. Okay, so this brings us to the working hypothesis, or our working hypothesis for TDP, 43 pathogenesis. So we have a protein which is predominantly in the nucleus, but it's able to shuttle between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. So we assume that something has to go wrong here, either that there is a problem 
with the TDP itself, that it changes the conformation or the biochemical properties, that it's no longer able to go back to the nucleus, or there's something wrong with the import machinery or something like that. Once that happens, the idea is that once it starts, we have TDP as a seed, which then um, acts like whatever of TDP goes out, somehow gets entrapped into the cytoplasm and starts to form these inclusions, and we end up with having cytoplasmic TDP in the in form of inclusions, and we have a loss of the nuclear staining. And there are now a lot of things we have to um, investigate. So we have, first of all, we have a lot of genetic factors we know. We have mutations beside TDP. We have mutations in three other genes which lead to accumulation um, of TDP. So this is quite complex. It's, I will not talk about the interaction between these things with TDP. We are more focusing on what are the role of post-translational conformational changes um, of TDP in the disease state. For example, what is the role of the truncation, the role of phosphorylation, and what is the role, of, so is there evidence for misfolding or amyloid-like formation of TDP in the disease? Um, and then finally, so, and this is something I will tell you in a minute, and then finally we are interested in this question, so what is actually the consequence of that for cell does, is it a loss of TDP function, is it a neurotoxic effect or of TDP species, or is it an effect that upon accumulation here we have a sequestration of other vital factors into these inclusions. And this is something we are trying to address with um, transgenic uh, mouse models, and this is also something I want to talk about. So, as a first project we are we're currently working on is to get more insights in the biophysical physical conformational properties of TDP. So far, TDP diseases are still thought to be non-amyloid diseases because they are, as I said, they are not positive for conventional amyloid dyes like congruent tioflavin. On the electron microscopy, these inclusions are not really fibrillar. They are usually predominantly granular or amorphous material. Also, the in, in Using recombinant TDP, the fibrils which are formed are not um, positive for tioflavin F. So we don't have a really good effort to, to study the conformational properties of TDP. So what we um, were using in, in, in the lab in, in Zurich where I came, what they did, they worked a lot on these new luminescence conjugated polymers, which are conformation sensitive optical probes. So what they are, these are molecules with um, a flexible polytiophilic chain, and the thing is they have a, so the backbone can change, and depending on how the backbone looks like, the fluorescence changes. And what has been shown, that the, which means if there's a twisted backbone of these um, LCPs, you have a blue-green fluorescence. If, if there's a planar backbone, there's a red fluorescence. And what has been shown for other proteins, once these LCPs bind to amyloid-like structures, it gets into this planar backbone, which means you would expect that there is a shift towards the red fluorescence. Um, and this LCPs have been used for a lot of other misfolded um, proteins, like a lot of these things have been done for the prion protein, but it has also been shown for Ebetra and for tau and for some systemic amyloidosis that this is a really powerful tool to, to visualize um, amyloid-like structures, and it has also been shown that they are these spectroscopic properties from these um, compounds, they are actually able to um, differentiate between different conformations of a protein, which have been done a lot for these um, PRP strains, um, where you have different conformations of the prion protein, which have specific properties um, with respect to, to, to clinical um, symptoms and um, morphology of these diseases. Okay, though so we thought it's not a stupid idea to test them for our TDP um, diseases, and indeed what we found is, or I'll just tell you what we are, what you are doing. So you just add the compound on the section, and then you get a signal, in the ideal scenario, you get a signal like that, which means you have binding to the nucleus, you have binding to something which looks very similar to the inclusions what we see, and you have some background. And what you then do, you excite with a, um, at 405 nanometer, and then you measure the complete emission spectrum from 450 to 800 nanometers. 
um, for your um, points of interest. And if you do that, what you get is when you look at the, um, so this is the black is the, the inclusion, green is the nucleus, and in red is the, the spectrum you get for the inclusion. So what you see is that the background and the nucleus, you have a maximum around 550. Um, this is the emission spectrum. And what you see upon binding to these inclusions, you see these curves, there's a shift towards the red fluorescence, which tells you that this one, this binding here leads to a change in the, in the molecular structure of these LCPs, which is highly suggestive that it binds to an amyloid-like structure. Um, and this is so you can then do a lot of spectral unmixing, which allows you to make nicer images of that, which means that these are specifically in the, the inclusion of the specific spectrum, the nucleus and the, the background. And this also works pretty nice for inclusions in, in ALS, where you can see this shift here um, uh, towards the red. Um, and so they would be thought, okay, that's perfect. We have something which allows us to detect um, these inclusions, which is highly suggestive that it is an amyloid-like structure. And then we thought, there, and then we went back that there is that TDP pathology in FTD patients is not really similar in all the patients. We have an heterogeneity in these diseases, and we thought it might be interesting to look whether we have actually different conformations of TDP, which might explain the different flavors of TDP diseases we are seeing. And I'm sorry, I have to bother you a bit with, with some of the details of these, <laughs> these types. So we have four different types, and they have different morphology. I'm not going into detail, though, because they, you have to believe me, they look a little bit different. The important thing is why we think that this is really interesting is that in our initial round, when we generated antibodies against TDP, what we realized already there is when we, we started injecting with type 1, type 2, type 3, and we ended up with antibodies for type 1, so this was generated by injecting mice with a type 1 case. And we ended up with antibodies which only recognized TDP C-terminal fragments in type 1 cases and not in type 2 and type 3 cases. And the same, we got antibodies for type, in, when we ejected with a type 2 case, we got this antibody which does not recognize type 1 or type 3. Also, we know that all of them recognize TDP. So this was all already suggestive that there is a, either a conformational, though most likely a conformational difference between the C-terminal fragments between the different types. Um, and there, then there are some other interesting thing why we think it is worth continue working on that is that these different types are not only a fantasy of neuropathologists, there's actually some clinical relevance behind that, that they are associated with a specific clinical um, setting, meaning that, for example, type 2, always these patients have motor neuron disease. And the other important thing is that there is a genetic relevance. So if we look at familiar cases with these type of mutations, they always come with the same type of pathology and that differs. So just looking at the pathology, I can tell you if it's a familiar case, what the mutation will be. So it means that there, this is something it wants to tell us something. So, and, um, so the question what we, are currently asking, and we really had the hard times to get enough material um, to work with, because we need to have to do that on frozen material, is that we collected now enough patients where we have these different types of, of pathology. All of them are recognized by these LCPs, and if we did, the, did some, some analysis of the curves of, these, the, of the spectrum, we realized that indeed there might be some changes in the emission spectrum um, of these LCPs in the different types of inclusions, which is highly suggestive that indeed there might be slight conformational changes um, of, of the TDP um, in the inclusions, which suggests that there might be actually something like TDP strains. Um, so we use the urea fraction 
and only the high molecular material. So it's, com so it's very, very insoluble material what we injected. It's soluble in urea, but not really good because it's still somehow in the stacker. <laughs> um, okay, so we think that this is worth continuing now in, 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 in a large series um, of cases. And in addition, what we think that these LCPs might be powerful tools now to study TDP aggregation in cell culture models um, to get more ideas about the maturation of inclusion body formation um, and so on. So this is something we are keen to look at the various cell culture models and also animal models. But that the la other thing what we are interested in is, is to get some answers into these questions by looking at in vivo models. And what we started um, some years ago, which is now done by a PhD student, we established um, several transcriptionic mice. Um, with the, though they all express that under the mouse prion protein, protein promoter, and they are all in a pure black six background, which allows us to compare all of them. Though the idea what we had is though we need wild type overexpressing mice just to see if wild type per se is, is toxic. We wanted to find out the consequences of the mutations, and especially with an overexpressing model, the, whether there's a gain of function, and we chose these two. Um, human pathogenic mutation. And then at the last, we thought, is it already enough to increase the cytoplasmic level of TDP? And then there we used a um, form of TDP, which are the um, changed nuclear localization sequence. So the, it always started very, first, though, or very interesting in a way that we didn't have problems to get mice for the TDP mutations and for the NLS, but we had a very hard time and also other labs had a very hard time to get mice overexpressing at least some levels of wild type TDP. So we only had two, we were lucky to get two um, out of 12 founders. When we, so we were lucky in a way that the expression levels of the mice we, we got, we were able to collect some which allowed us to collect those which have more or less similar expression level um, of the transgene. So this is here done with a human-specific um, TDP antibody in the lines we, we kept, which is a, the wild type um, overexpressing mice, one line with these mutation, two lines with the 337 V mutation, and then one line with an NLS um, change. And more or less the expression pattern of the transgene is quite similar, so which allows us to compare the effects, what we see in these mice, um, or to correlate that to the, to the transgene. So the, very pr quickly, the TDP, wild type overexpressing mice, they have TDP in the nucleus where you expect it. The mutation mice, they have it predominantly in the nucleus. And for the NLS mice, as we expected, there's still, there, there's a lot in the cytoplasm, but at least in vivo, these um, NLS mutations are still able to get into the nucleus, most likely by, by forming dimers. Um, so there are still some nuclear um, ex transition expression, also they have a um, deleted NLS um, construct. So, and then actually the interesting thing what we found is when we looked at the phenotype is that the mice which have the worst, really the worst phenotype are the mice expressing the wild type TDP. The 348, 337 mutations, they are more or less, they are fine. Um, the NLS line there, it's not here, but they are also fine. They live for two years and that's, that's fine. Um, the, um, so if we cross these wild type mice to homozygosity, they die around day 20. So there's a very traumatic effect um, of, these, um, of the overexpressing of wild type, and this is how this mouse looks at the end stage, which is a very short disease duration, what we have. So it just does not want to move any longer, and it has this roundish appearance, which has also been described by other people, and we think that most of these things is coming by a dysfunction of the gut motility, actually, there we have some evidence for that. 
So we did, or Torsten had to do a lot of phenotypic characterization with that, and um, which were, a lot of them were quite frustrating. So what we see is that at the, definitely at the end of um, the, around three to five months, what we see is that the wild type seven mice, they show a loss of um, body weight. We don't see significant changes in motor tests. We don't see dramatic changes um, in the so in some cognitive tests like the y maze in the open field, and there is some evidence for slight cognitive impairment in a novel object recognition test, which is shown here. So, but overall, this phenotypic characterization was quite more or less more frustrating. So we don't see a obvious cell deaths, no cytoplasmic TDP accumulations, no really biochemical alterations of TDP, which what we see. In, in human patients. So this was, um, that's how it is. So, and then we thought, okay, so maybe one reason is that, that we, that these phenotypes comes, can be explained by a selective downregulation of the murine TDP, which is more severe in the wild type 7 line. But what we show here is by, by Tuckman RT-PCR of the endogenous um, mouse TDP, the we see that there is a downregulation of what we expect, but this downregulation around to, to 60, 70% is more or less similar in all the lines what we have. So this might most likely does not explain um, the, the phenotype or the, the, the difference we see between wild type overexpressing and the other mutants. So, but to summarize what the lessons, what we learned from the mice and to combine that with what is published. So I think we are all agree that overexpression of TDP is toxic in vivo. The toxicity is dependent on expression level. And from our NLS mice, what we see is increase of cytoplasmic TDP per se is not sufficient to induce a toxic effect. In our hands, though, def so in my understanding, there is no evidence so far that TDP mutations are more toxic. So in our hands, definitely, they are less toxic. Um, the, the increase, so this is our interpretation so far, the increase of a fully functional wild type TDP is sufficient to cause a lethal phenotype, most li likely by an over or dysfunction of the protein with possible downstream effects. The fact that similar levels of mutated TDP is less effective in generating this effect might argue in our understanding for a partial loss of function uh, mechanism of these mutations. So, and I think the important thing is that current transgenic mice, I think they definitely, none of them which um, have been published, they do not reflect the characteristic hallmark lesions of human TDP diseases and are therefore, I think, not really disease models, but they allow us to investigate the effects of the proliferation of TDP homeostasis and its consequences. And this might help us to hopefully then also understand what's going on in the disease state. Um, but I think that's, and the other thing what I have to, I think we all started with overexpressing mice, which um, is okay, but now having to deal with all this auto-regulation stuff, I think we really have to go the hard way and get good knock-in models, which allows us to study the effects of mutations in a, in a, um, a knock-in model um, to really get answers to that. Okay, in my second part, I want to briefly summarize what we are working um, on the FAS part. So FAS is a quite similar protein, like um, or related protein to um, TDP. It's, a, its full name is fused in sarcoma. It's also ubiquitously expressed. It's a multifunctional DNA RNA binding protein. It was originally described as a component of a fusion oncogenes in cancers. And also here it's predominantly nuclear. Um, and less cytoplasm, and also here it is involved in more or less every step um, of um, transcription and mRNA maturation, um, like suggested for uh, and shown for, as for TDP. Also here we got interested into that protein when in 2009 mutations were been, have been first described by these two groups in a subset of TDP43 negative forms of ALS, and now a lot of mutations have been um, identified. The most of them cluster in the extreme C-terminus, and we are sure that these are 
from a genetic perspective, they are really clearly pathogenic. They are found in a lot of families and they are also segregating um, with the disease in families. These mutations here in the middle, they are only some of them were found in familiar cases also. It has not been shown that they, they will not be able to show that they are segregated because they didn't have DNA from other um, patients in the family. And also pathology has not been demonstrated for these cases. So we are not sure if these are really disease uh, pathogenic um, mutations. So the, the, therefore, we more or less focused on these C terminal um, mutations, and we did some cell culture characterization. We joined up with um, Christian Haas because they were actually working on the same thing. Um, so what we realized when we looked at the sequence of FAS that these extreme C terminus um, has a high similarity to a consensus sequence for non-classical nuclear localization sequence, which is called PYNLS, which is recognized by transportin. And indeed, that's what um, Doro was able to show, that this is indeed when you fuse the, the C terminus of FAS to a GST GFP vector, you see that now the GST GFP is predominantly found in the nucleus, which is a proof that indeed this is a functional nuclear localization sequence. And if we then looked at these here in asterisk, we see the, the positions where pathogenic mutations have been identified. And we looked at all these different um, mutations and did a quantification of the nuclear with the cytoplasmic um, FAS. And what you see is that, they're, that they're, all of them really show a cytoplasmic um, staining now for the for for the fast and but there is some variability from mutation to mutation and the interesting thing is that actually the degree of nuclear import impairment inversely correlates to the age of onset which was described um, for these um, mutation carriers so which means the more impairment um, the younger the dis or the the younger the disease onset and the shorter the disease um, duration, so there's a close correlation between that. And having this data, we thought that we we asked the question whether there are distinct pathological patterns actually associated with strong mutations or weak mutations. And this is a study I did in collaboration with Ian McKenzie. And so these these patients are extremely rare, and we so it looks like these are not many cases, but this is actually the largest series which has published so far. And I think these are more or less all patients which are out there, um, which means we have um, six cases with various um, mutations. And we just did a detailed analysis of the pathological findings um, in these um, patients. And what we found is actually that the one of these type of inclusions for these characteristic in these patients are these so-called basophilic inclusions. What we realized is that there were actually three cases which have had really a lot of them, the others didn't. Then we looked at the neuronal fat pathology. All of them had a lot in the spinal cord, as what we expected. The motor cortex was more affected in three, in these last three, and other regions beyond the motor, cord, motor system, like the striatum, was only affected in the other three. And then we also realized that there's also abundant glial pathology with fat. And also, this was um, striking that we found clear pathology only in the first three, but not in the others. And if we then looked at the correlation with the mutation and the disease onset, what we found is indeed we have two patterns, and they nicely correlate with the clinical disease severity and also with the degree of nuclear import impairment of the type of mutation in cell culture. So it means weak mutations, longer onset, longer disease duration, a lot of um, a lot of gliopathology, only single basophilic inclusions, strong mutations, very short disease uh, or very young disease onset, very short disease duration, and a different pattern um, of pathology. So, which means that nuclear import impairment of FAS with consecutive increase of cytoplasmic FAS levels seems to be a key event in our understanding of ALS FAS pathogenesis. And based on that, we um, our idea is now to, to generate mouse models um, to study ALS with fast mutations. And the approach we use is more the same. We have, again, the prion um, protein promoter. And we express the wild-type fast 
and we chose a mutation which is an uh, C-terminal truncation mutation which has a very um, early disease onset and which was also described by us in a German family. And these are the founders um, we got. So we have expression levels ranging between one to two and six fold. And also here we have these different levels which allows us now to pick comparable levels of transgene for, for wild type and for the mutant, which is important that we are able to compare the effects. Very briefly, what we see for the, the wild type fuss, as we expected, is still in the nucleus, while the um, C-terminal truncation mutation shows a lot of um, fuss staining in the cytoplasm. Um, and as a last part, I want to give you some novel insights what we have on the our understanding of the FTD forms with fast pathology. Because there's something interesting with them, so I don't want to go into detail how they look like, but we have different morphological flavors how FTLD fast comes. Most neuropathologists don't know how they look like, so I don't tell you the details. So, but the interesting thing is that if you have a, have a patient with clinical phenotype with ALF and FAS pathology, this patient almost always has a, has a FAS mutation. If you have F frontotemporal dementia with FAS pathology, these patients don't have FAS mutations. So there's a striking difference between that, and they are, there's no overlap between these. So what is the mechanism in, for these sporadic diseases? And we thought to look at the first thing, or the idea was, whether if there's a general problem with the, with the transporting machinery, we, we would expect that other PYNLS proteins should actually also be affected and should start to accumulate um, in, the, in the cytoplasm. And that's why we started to look at first at the homologs of the fat, uh, of the fused in sarcoma protein, which is Ewing sarcoma and TAF15. So these are, they, are, they all, as a, as a fat protein family. Their function is structurally highly similar. They are shuttling and all have a PYNLS. And they are able to interact with each other and therefore we thought it's not stupid to look at them in all our cases. To make a long story short, so the ALS patients with the FAS mutations, they have FAS pathology. These inclusions are not labeled with TAF15 or EWS, which is also shown here in double labeling experiments. So, here, definitely, TUF and EWS does not play a role. We confirmed that also that it's not some post-mortem um, problem we are seeing. We confirmed that in our cell culture model where we have the cytoplasmic fast pathology, and when we see that there is no change of TUF and EWS in our cell culture model, and also in our transgenic mice, we don't see changes of these um, homologs. So cytoplasmic accumulation of FAS per se does not trigger an alteration in the subcellular distribution of its homologs, and it does not lead to a sequestration of TAF15 and EWS in the inclusions as a secondary phenomenon. So, but then we found something in, uh, interesting that indeed in the FTD patients with FAS pathology, TAF15 shows exactly the same pattern as, um, uh, as FAS. And it's even more striking that for TAF15, we see this also, like for TDP, this very dramatic change um, in the norm, though with a loss of nuclear staining um, for TAF15 in inclusion-bearing cells. And the same is shown for EWS. This is confirmed in, by double labeling fluorescence. And we did also some biochemical analysis, which showed us that all of these um, proteins show a change in their solubility um, in the disease state. So this brings us to, to our idea what we think is um, why this might be interesting. The co-accumulation of all members of the fat protein is characteristic for the inclusions in FTLD fast, but not in ALS with fast mutations. So first of all, this allows a clear separation between genetic and non-genetic forms just by looking at them. And, but the, I think the most important thing is that it implies different pattern mechanisms which underlies both of these fast diseases. So under normal condition, what we think, what, no, what we have is we have these 
free proteins and they are able to interact with transporting and that therefore it goes into the nucleus and we have that normal distribution. In patients with a C-terminal fast mutation, it's clear we have some problem here in the PYNLS, which makes it less able to interact with transporting, while the others, they are not affected, and we end up with fast inclusions, but the others are not, um, are not affected. So here it seems that it's really quite restricted to a dysfunction of fast. While it is more complex and there seems to be a more global um, impairment in the forms with frontotemporal dementia in fast pathology. And there are partly two um, things how you might want to explain that. The one is that there are altered post translational modifications of um, the fat proteins, which make it less able to interact with transporting, and therefore you see an accumulation of these proteins in the cytoplasm. Or you have a change uh, more on the transporting or the transporting uh, machinery, either by really altered transporting or by decreased levels of transporting, which would then lead to this scenario where we have accumulation of all these proteins in the cytoplasm and a depletion of this protein in the nucleus. Okay, with that, I want to conclude. So the discoveries of TDP43 and FAS, and more recently also TAF and EWS, of components in the inclusions, they resolve the long-standing enigma concerning the nature. And it has introduced a new nomenclature for these diseases, which now has just FTD, and you just have the name of the protein at the end. It, they provide a clear molecular evidence that ALS and FTD indeed represent a spectrum of disorders that share similar pathological mechanisms. They implicate alterations in RNA processing as a key event in both these conditions. However, the fact that TDP and FAS accumulation seems to be mutually exclusive, it most likely implies that there is at least slightly independent disease mechanism. And obviously, it opened up complete new avenues of research into FTD and ALS. Um, and with that, I want to end with mentioning my co-workers. So this is um, my lab, and as I already mentioned, the the TDP mice are characterized by Torsten, the FAS mice um, by Chiara, and the RCP stuff was um, done by Claudia. Um, then I have a very close collaboration with, with Ian McKenzie on all of these human um, stuff, and I still have access to the material in Munich, and we got some cases with FAS mutations from Olaf and importantly also the, the collaboration with Christian Haas Group in Munich on the cell culture models for FAS. And with that, I want to thank for your attention. Thank you.